Chapter 15. Pathology. Personality Disorders. Personality disorders describe a style of thinking, behaving and feeling. I see personality through the prism of development. But, before we go into this, let us make one thing very clear. We all have certain traits. When the traits are missing, or they are accentuated, we are talking about personality disorder. Imagine a piano where some of the keys are missing or a tune which ignores many of the keys. This is a personality disorder. When we are not suffering from personality disorders, we possess all the keys and play them in accordance to the song or rhythm that is going on around us. We may accentuate keys and that is where nature and nurture come into play. The level of organization in any personality tends to change when under pressure. It will change in accordance with the personality type. Under pressure, the personality is prone to become less sophisticated. Tendencies become more pronounced and we use terms like regression. By this, we mean that previous sophistications and acceptable behavior are partially and sometimes completely abandoned. Personality functioning oscillates around a norm, which is a norm in accordance to the stress we are under and our personality. We can discuss personality in the way that it functions, or in the case of personality disorders, in ways that it doesn't function. As I said, I prefer to describe personality disorders in terms of development. As you recall, the first task the newborn has is to realize that it is different from his surroundings and to somehow get that outside world to supply the newborn with his demands. If you remember, we talked about the newborn experiencing virtual chaos, where nothing is ordered, neither in time nor space. We define this kind of organization in an illness as being psychotic. It is the way we continue to organize all our stored experiences, dreamlike. We arrive at the stage where the child is aware and there is a sense of self. I use this word as the definition of non-self and self to be the most rudimentary steps in the evolution of personality. When the adult behaves as if he has never completely passed this stage, we call the personality borderline personality disorder, BPD. In other words, the person can and will cross the border into psychosis very easily at times of stress. The BPD can and indeed does recross the border, and return to sanity when the stress is relieved. Like all borderline events, conditions dictate to which side of the border the subject will be. In this definition, BPD is erroneous because it gives feeling of a finite point, the border. It is as if now you are in Germany and now you are in France. Borderline gives a sense of the dichotomy where they may either be on one side of the border or the other. This is not so most of the time. In my opinion, we are talking not of the border, but of a sort of no man's land which is neither on one side of the border nor the other. It is as if the border is not a pencil line on a map, but a broad swathe of land. Under stress, we tend to decompensate. The BPD is far more akin to a subject living in a wide no man's land. Sometime the BPD approaches normalcy and sometimes psychosis. Nevertheless, the BPD is never really mistaken to be either truly normal or truly psychotic. The most striking thing in the BPD is very poor impulse control and an ever-present sense of anger. The BPD and the antisocial personality, as you will see, have a lot in common. I think the two are synonymous. At this point, I would have told David not to express those opinions till he passed every board certification exam. The borderline personality under stress loses what little ability he has to define himself and to define others. Everything becomes chaotic, and like in a child, impulse control is greatly reduced. The borderline psychotic under pressure behaves like a psychotic. Not necessarily like a schizophrenic but there is a definite disorganization of the contact with previous experiences and the ability to select the fittest thought to plot the future. Indeed, they seem to lose the ability to see time and space in the way that others do. The borderline personality lives a life of chaos. I would suggest we were not born in original sin, we were born in original chaos. I accept the theory that the borderline personality is the product of a highly traumatic, very early life experience, Without being judgmental, BPD is the product of very bad parenting, where the child has not learned to trust and define himself. I refer you again to the concept of splitting. The borderline personality is very much a splitter. Just as for the infant, there is only good and bad, what is not good is bad. Things are black and white, there is no gray. Unfortunately, the black and white seem to be interchangeable. 
Again, there is no sense of history. The BPD does not remember that today's black is yesterday's white. They are not lying. At this level of organization, we also see projection of bad onto something or someone else. To digress, we are now aware of different kinds of factual error. The psychotic manufactures new experiences, the hysteric distorts and the BPD shuffles the pack. To continue the bad parenting paradigm, I want to discuss the antisocial personality. In my experience, there is a vast difference between the sociopathic, antisocial, personality and psychopathic personality. When the sociopath arrives at the stage where he is learning social mores and to internalize anxiety, he is unable to do so. The sociopath is unable to internalize anxiety and unable to withhold any urges or combat any frustrations. The main difference between antisocial personality and BPD is that the antisocial does not acquire any of the social beliefs and mores that his peers receive. The borderline seems unaware that they even exist. I will discuss the difference between antisocial and psychopathic personality, shortly. If I dare to use my concept about fantasies, the psychopath does not have inbuilt sensors. He will live his dream no matter what, unless he has learned the consequences are not worth the cost. The psychopath is never sorry at the act they committed, they are sorry they got caught. The sociopath is similar, but he is aware that it was wrong, but I couldn't control myself. Both learn very quickly how to become the sufferer and not the benefactor if they had not been caught. In a nutshell, you can picture three kinds of personalities with the tendency to be delinquent, each with differing pathologies. We will add a fourth shortly. Let us assume the developing child has passed the phase of self, non-self. At this point, we are discussing the child's ability to organize, react to impulses from without and maybe to control anxiety. The child should be able to control the anxiety he meets as he faces a new world. As you remember, this is the anxiety of learning if I stick my hand here, will I be electrocuted? This anxiety is similar to performance anxiety. In the well-adjusted, it will drive him on. But, far too often, the child experiences the anxiety of the mother. The child is constantly trying to deal with the anxiety of another, which is often unpredictable. We see the combination of nature and nurture, and in many respects, there is a very good chance that sociopathic or borderline personality parents will beget a similar child. Interjection is another important landmark that we can use in the development stage of explaining disorders. There is such a disorder known as the dysmythic personality. This is a person who is perpetually sad. They seem to interject into themselves everything that is bad, and they wander around life being miserable and making everybody else miserable. The more sophisticated ones manage to get themselves into a situation where they can explain why they are sad and justify it. There is always an explanation, but the bottom line is that they are looking for a reason to be sad. For many reasons, these people are very hard to treat. They are experts at projecting the reasons for their sadness outward and interjecting all the woes of the world onto themselves. They just do not see how or why it can be different. Because they have to justify their sadness, they are not prepared to seek an explanation or salvation. These traits can linger as the child develops and can become part of all the other further personality disorders that we shall discuss. Let's go further, and suppose the child is now at the stage where he can distinguish between himself and the surroundings and there he sticks. Something interesting happens. At that point in development, the child is completely involved in himself. Often, the parent may encourage it. In fact, it is a normal part of development that the child should become narcissistic. There is nothing wrong with narcissism. In fact, it is my belief that a strong sense of self-worth is the key to mental health. But, we are discussing what can go wrong and what does go wrong. If the child becomes stuck in this stage, he develops a narcissistic personality disorder. There are two things which are characteristics of a narcissistic personality disorder. A sense of elation and pessimism, as the self-worth is elated or downgraded in the eyes of the beholder, the person himself. Very often, we find that so-called cyclothymic personalities are really narcissistic personalities, whose moods wax and wane in accordance to their self-worth at that moment. The other aspect of the narcissistic personality disorder is the sudden rage, the so-called narcissistic rage. The narcissist can explode at the least slight, whether it be intended or imagined. The explosion can be violent, 
unexpected and yet, when we examine carefully the history, we find that there have been previous tendencies in the past. In my experience, many murders are committed in a narcissistic rage. Hell has no fury like a narcissist spurned. There are three levels of narcissism. The first level is where the narcissist is completely unable to identify that opposite him, there is something of worth. It is as if the other person is there, but of complete no consequence. At this level, the narcissist is at a similar level of organization to the relatively well-ordered BPD. In addition to everything else at this level, they have very poor impulse control. The next level of narcissism is similar to the two dreams of Joseph in the Old Testament. In the first dream, Joseph sees sheaths of wheat assembled around one sheath in the middle, and they are bowing down to the one in the middle. Here we see that the person is able to identify that there is someone out there, but that someone is exactly like him, and he has no way of identifying what the other person may be thinking or feeling. He makes a facsimile by projecting his own thoughts and feelings onto the other. At this stage, the narcissist only knows how he feels and this is the way the other must feel. Very often, this person seems to be empathetic, putting himself in the other person's shoes. In actual fact, he puts himself in his own shoes, as if the other person was wearing them. In the second dream, Joseph dreams of a firmament in which stars spin round the sun. At this stage, the narcissist can identify that there are differences between himself, and the other is secondary to the narcissist spinning around the narcissist's orbit. Narcissists become adept at making themselves the center of everything. They win people over and they are true chameleons. But, they are attention seekers and emotional parasites. They take, they cannot give and they can be amazingly callous. It is as if there is no feeling. Many a narcissist will have moments of insight and report a sense of being dead inside. The lack of feeling is not that experienced by a psychotic. Bearing in mind that narcissists suffer narcissistic rage. If this rage is internalized, suicide can be imminent. The schizophrenic is liable to commit suicide in similar circumstances. However, the cause is not rage, but a moment of insight and understanding. We are often at loss when a narcissist commits suicide. Deep inside, we are not when a schizophrenic does so. It is particularly sad because the insight could be used as the first step in therapy. I promised a fourth personality with criminal tendencies. You may have guessed, it is the narcissist. I am very proud that on both sides of our family, we have some eccentric tendencies. One of my mother's cousins chose to go to trial instead of paying a fine for driving through a red light. Of course I saw it, Malud, but I thought it was there for the locals. Unfortunately, Malud did not appreciate the explanation nor did our cousin appreciate getting banged up for contempt. Life for narcissists is not always plain sailing. Happiness Factor the child is now wandering away from the parent and discovering the world. If the child has not learned to cope with overcoming the parent's anxiety, he is learning the joys of curiosity. He can decipher what is joy and what is not. As the toddler encounters the world, he is learning and receiving feedback that some of it is good and some of it is bad. But, he doesn't know which is which. He is in a permanent state of anxiety, but unhindered, this performance anxiety will serve him well. The child will always try to reduce his anxiety. At this point, parenting comes into play, whereby the good enough parent, picture the Madonna and child, will do everything to reduce a child's anxiety and to encourage exploring. The world's anxiety producing tendency is predictable, thus controllable, and becomes valuable performance anxiety. The complete opposite happens when the parent is anxious. The child starts learning by rote. He repeats things and chooses the best possibility. But, the child can never really guess how to control both sets of anxieties, the world's and his parents. We've all seen children repeating certain activities until they eventually get tired of them. The activities in themselves tend to release a sense of well-being very similar to the transitional object. Unfortunately, like the transitional object it cannot work, but the child seems to be unable to reject this behavior and continues repeating patterns. This kind of behavior is called the obsessive personality. It is as if the child gains some control over anxiety, albeit only temporarily. But, this is the best deal attainable. As you see, what was a coping and developmental mechanism now becomes behavior and eventually becomes personality or personality trait.
We all have obsessive tendencies, as we all have tendencies to almost every trait. As we have discussed, the behavior of the child is very much a way of adapting to the ever-increasing circles of humanity that he is meeting. So, the child will adapt to mother and her beliefs, to family and their beliefs, extended family, religion, neighborhood and nationality. Each come with a shorthand code of unquestioned expectations, their beliefs. Indeed, he will adapt to almost anything. I often wonder when, in the development of the child, does belief start to exist? Is this the point where the child internalizes them one by one in the automatic everything? I think that even borderline personalities are capable of believing, but their belief is very very brittle and dogmatic. As the child develops, he employs certain beliefs and then may reject them. But, as it is with the placebo effect, the transitional object and even repetitious behavior, some of the belief sticks. As a whole, belief is based on the personality and traits of the group or family you choose to belong to or are born into. As the child enters wider and wider circles, he can encounter traumatic events, which he tends to cope with by repression. We all do this. We all undergo some form of trauma, but when the tendency to repress is marked, then we have what is called a hysterical personality. At the other end of the scale of defense mechanism, in other words, when the child is at puberty, the role of idealization comes into play and the important role of developing fantasies and self-censoring. If the censorship is too rigid, the child will become anxious and guilt-ridden. We discuss the child in relation to ever-growing concentric circles of involvement and belonging to different, but ever-increasing circles we all experience in early life. The circles are the immediate family, larger family, school, religion and so on. In other words, how the child and young adult defines himself or herself with priorities. The intensity of feelings are similarly prioritized. But, this is not always so. In the perfect world, the priorities concentric circles are perfectly round. Picture a topographical map showing a hill. The hill is round and for a change of 50 feet in height, the map shows a line. In the round hill, we see a series of round concentric circles. Now imagine a rift, a valley on one side of the hill. Almost all the topography shows that, at a certain distance from the summit, you are at a certain height. But, in the rift the topography changes. It is as if you are nearer or further than you expected. Narcissists often exhibit a similar rift. In certain circumstance and in certain points, the narcissist behaves as if they are somewhere else. This is not decompensation, it is a built-in constant phenomenon of this personality. It explains how we see what seems to be jovial, well-functioning people at work who, in different places, behave in shocking ways. As David would say, back in Yorkshire it would be summed up as, there's now as queer as folks. Let us look at the psychopath. I have mentioned that beliefs are central in the automatic. Everything. We acquire them and adopt them. They fulfill a role. We belong and we accept. We are part of a herd. For the herd to exist, there has to be an ability to obey. Norms do change. They have purposes and sometimes they are praiseworthy. The psychopath is not someone who has chosen not to believe. The psychopath is incapable of believing. Psychopaths know what fear is, but they have no concept of anxiety. They can exhibit remorse on being caught, but not anxiety before the crime. To paraphrase Napoleon, they neither learn nor do they forget. Now imagine the true wolf in sheep's clothing. A psychopathic so-called believer. A man of the cloth who manipulates, connives and exploits, all in the name of the good Lord. One quick joke to highlight the psychopath. My cousin with the traffic light claimed, M, lewd, I am being persecuted by a vicious judiciary because of my deeply held beliefs. I believed I would not get caught. Finally, let us discuss altruism. I always deeply suspect an altruist. Most of them I will discuss under behavior disorders. Make no mistake, there are some people who are good, but nobody is a saint. When people start behaving as if they were saints and putting their personal interests above those of everybody else, one has to wonder why. As a summary, personality is the me that I know. It is myself as I accept myself. It is me within the skin that I know. It is a compendium of the ways we feel, think and behave. 
Our personality consists of two basic factors, what we acquired at birth and what we acquired along the way. Very often, the genes that we acquire will also dictate what we acquire along the way because our parents not only donate genes, but their genes determine how they bring us up. This is particularly so in our younger years and as we get older, we acquire behavioral standards in accordance with the circles which we identify and associate ourselves with. Behavior is also affected greatly by our belief system, which again is partially part of the genetic system we acquire and partially the road we travel. As I said before, in many respects, it is dictated by luck, the genes we acquired from our parents and the environment. The environment is not just happenstance, as you will see later when we are discussing behavioral disorders, society and the individual interaction. We are not born hopeless and helpless, and yet, we are not omnipotent. It is most important to realize that the child who never knew the golden age of happiness will ascribe his life aims to reducing anxiety. This personality disorder will beget the neuroses, 